Ibrahim. Let me first thank you very much for inviting me, and thank you and also Dr. Naim for and your staff for organizing such a wonderful discussion. Uh, I would like to start by suggesting uh, that what I talk today is my personal view, so I'm not representing the official view, because if the official view, I have to be very strict, yes and no, you know, and uh, so I would try to uh, be uh, uh, looking at the issue from the scholarly angle. Usually I do it by a joke. I don't know whether Sunday morning can start with a joke or not mm. in Istanbul. And the joke is what's the difference between a, uh, a diplomat, a soldier, and a scholar. And the answer is a soldier is paid to die for this, his country. You know, because soldiers lose. These days you talk about militarization. So there are a lot of people who are ready to die. And ambassadors or diplomats are paid to lie about their countries. Uh, uh, and the scholars are paid to explain why he is ready to lie, why he is ready to die. But uh, so I'm in the mood of explaining why. Uh, why the situation is as it is today. Well, how we can analyze order today. Very quick conceptualization. ABC. Uh, triple A, triple B, triple C, very quickly. R E A, there was an architecture. The architecture was, uh, let's say, a, a long time here, designed by Westerners, first by uh, Saispico, Franco, British, then it was mostly Pax Britannica, then it, it came, became Pax Americana, or then later bipolar. But this architecture didn't work because of not just recent issues. It's very important. It's not just last five years. Second A is accumulation of significant security and strategic shifts <laughs> and challenges. The first, I think, was the Islamic Revolution of Iran in 1979, which made a crack in the whole fabric of bipolar architecture. Iran said neither east nor west, and I think it was the first crack in this. And Iran was part of the west. And then, of course, after that, you had a lot of activities to reorder again Iran-Iraq war. But what's interesting in terms of your, your question, there was a type of Arab order. But this Arab order, was, uh, which was based on exclusion of Iran, uh, was uh, damaged by Saddam Hussein's invasion of Iraq, which, uh, of Kuwait, which ended finally with the invasion of American forces of Iraq. And then, of course, you had two invasions of Americans, which failed. So it's not just new. I mean, it's accumulated processes. Then, of course, you had this uh, end of Cold War. And I think the collapse of Soviet Union also changed the strategic fabric of the region. Then you had globalization, which brought a lot of changes from let's say, within the societies. And I think these accumulated processes should be taken into account. And uh, the classical balance of order was changed. And now you have a situation which is totally different. I think you cannot say there is no order at all. Still, there is Western dominance in a, lot of, a good part of this country, in this region. Uh, I think with the exception of Iran, which is providing its own security independently. The others usually are in alliance system with the United States. So you, there is a US alliance system here still. But I think it's not working, this whole fabric. And then the new order is not easy to design, because there are two ways for order. One is by a hegemon either regional or global, and second is from the bottom. I think none of them can happen. There, there is no space for hegemony any, anymore in the region. 
no global hegemon, no regional hegemon. So there should be an arrangement, as uh, Professor Naim said. Arrangement is possible. How? Quickly, B. My, is, I go to the cell layer, the second layer, B. I think here there are big states, regional big states. Four regional big, uh, big states, Egypt, Iran, Turkey, Saudi Arabia. They have a special position in the region. And they have a type of responsibility, maybe, for cleaning up the region, not by making hegemonic design or alliances against each other, but they can work together, I think, regardless of all challenges. They should also, uh, there should be an attention to bottom-up approach. It's not just by the state level, bottom-up. Finally, you have to take into account the bystanders. I mean, external forces are, are bystanders. They come and go, but we live in this region. However, we have to regulate the others. We cannot ignore them, we have to regulate them. For this to happen very quickly, what do we need? My three is here and I finish. First, I think we have to have a cognitive map. Our order starts from the mind, how we think. Language that you talked about relates also to how we think. And I think in the cognitive map, which is needed for a security arrangement, first of all, is the issue of acceptance. We have to accept each other as we are. And this is very important. You cannot reject any player, especially deep-rooted players here. You have to accept the diversity, and you have to accept the legitimate interests of regional players. Furthermore, in the cognitive map, zero-sum game doesn't work. There should be win-win cognitive understanding. And in this cognitive map, also, there, there is no place for hegemonic thinking. If you want to impose your hegemony, it is impossible, because the era of hegemony globally and regionally has passed. Uh, my second C in this regard is if there is this, conflict, this uh, cognitive map, then you should take care of conflict management. There are so many conflicts. You may not be able to solve them, but you have to manage them. And it can be done, because we had very difficult challenges in this region. You know, uh, yeah. Now, I think one of the best bilateral relations globally is Iran-Turkey relationship, regardless of challenges. But it is due to a long historical fact. Uh, actually, uh, we had a German group last week in our institute. They talked so much about Westphalian experience uh, of 1848, how it can be applied. Finish? One minute. I can't finish now. Uh, in uh, our institute, uh, they, they were talking how 14, 1848 uh, Westphalian model can be applied to Middle East today. I had to present, a, 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 let's say, a, a talk. And I said, look, before you had Westphalia, we had 1639 Qasr-Shirin uh, treaty between Iran and Turkey, which is still working. Actually, that is the base of our border. So I think what's important, that Qasr-Shirin didn't happen overnight. It was after so many years of war. Uh, I, I don't want to go, to go to the details of history, but we came to this understanding that we can manage our differences and conflicts. And finally, I would underline the common responsibilities of regional players. There is a responsibility for them, but it doesn't mean they should be the only players. They, it is not that expense of other players, but with power comes responsibility, but responsibility means inclusion also, including the others. So sum up, uh, arrangements uh, are possible for arrangements, 
regional players are very important. And for regional players, what is more important is their cognitive and understanding and a frame or principles that can help them. I'm optimistic, regardless of the challenges. Usually, crises have threats, but opportunities also. There is time of uh, challenge, but it's also time of opportunity. And let me end uh, by a good point about diplomats, because I was not fair to them in the beginning by the joke. And they say, a hope for diplomatic interactions, including what we need is diplomacy at this time. A hope for diplomats is like water for fish and courage for soldiers. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And let's hope that the